hold that hand tight. Don't let any air get through. Hold it tight. God, our Heavenly Father, we come now praying for the hand that we're holding. God, we pray that you would bless this hand. God, I pray now for the strength of this hand. God, we know not what they've had to go through. We know not what they've had to endure. We know not what opposition they've had to overcome. But God, I thank you for it because they made it to the house of prayer. So now, God, I squeeze a praise now into this hand. We squeeze strength now into this hand. I pray, God, that you would not let any weapon formed against them prosper. Thank you for what you're doing in their life. We pray for financial favor to rest in the hands of this, my neighbor. We pray for healing in this hand. We pray for deliverance in this hand. God, we ask that when you finish blessing them, turn around and bless me. Bless my family. God, I pray for financial favor for myself. And now, oh God, we pray that you would bless this, your preacher. Think with his mind, speak with his voice. In spite of his faults and obvious fatigue, get glory out of this earthen vessel. I confess, God, that I can't do this without you. I confess, God, and that I'm weak and I'm worn. But, oh, God, I claim your strength. So, God, we ask you to do it for us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And all those that love the Lord, let your neighbor's hand go. Put it in your other hand and give God praise. Amen. As you're still standing, I would that you would open your Bibles with me. And I need everyone to open the Bible. If you don't have one, we have one behind the pew for you. We knew you were coming and provided one for you. And as our gift to you, that is your Bible. Until the benediction. And you put it back. <laughs> so you can use it next time have your own. And while you're looking for Luke chapter 19, we thank God for the presence of Pastor Pastor Robinson. Amen. Who did an awesome job with the choir on that song. Amen. Amen. Pastor Lewis and to our other ministers in the pulpit and in the pews, officers of our church, you can heals and to our pastors and ministers' wives. I saw Sister Robinson earlier and Sister Cheney and our other deaconesses and Sister Mincy and our mothers, our ushers, this phenomenal choir, awesome musicians and singers, and visitors alike. We're grateful to God for your presence here this afternoon. I, I want to look at Luke chapter 19, verses 28, 29, rather, through 40. I want to deal with this triumphal entry of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem. This marks Passion Week. And I want to lift up this particular story. And most times during this season, this Lent season, this, this text is preached. But God showed it to me a different way this time. And... Um, I believe that it is possible to get fresh water from an old well. And that being the case, look again at Luke 19, verse 29 through 40. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering you shall find a coat tied whereon yet never man sat before loose him 
and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, what do you loose him? Thus say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent with, they that were sent went their way and found even as he said unto them. And as they were loosing the coat, the owners of the coat showed up and asked them, why loose ye the coat? And they said exactly what Jesus said, the Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus and they cast their garments upon the coat and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the Bible says the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all of the mighty works that they had seen. This is what they said. Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke your disciples. They're making too much noise. Jesus said unto them, I tell you, if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. We'll stop right there. You may be seated in the very presence of the Lord. I, I want to preach today with your prayers and by God's power from these words, the presentation of a king. Us as you may be seated, turn to someone, look him or her in the eye and say, neighbor, Jesus wants to be your king. Amen. You didn't say it like you meant it. Amen. I, I need you to tell your neighbor. It's all right to tell him. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, Jesus wants to be your king. Come on, give God some praise in this place. <clears throat> I'm a frequent flyer. And on every flight I've ever taken, there's always been a constant. There's always a certain point during the flight when the captain's voice comes over the intercom system and he informs the passengers that we're getting ready to land and the flight is coming to an end. And when that voice is heard, preparations are made for landing. Seats that are reclined are brought back in their upright position. Folding trays that are out are now folded back up and placed back in the arm rest. Portable electronic devices, if they were on, are then cut off. And those passengers, if they were seated without seat belts fastened, they would then fasten their seat belts. And everyone would then pray and hope for a safe landing. And without fail, every flight I've always taken, that constant has already been, always been there. And when I look at this particular passage of scripture with that thought in mind, I couldn't help but get the impression that I was reading about a flight that was getting ready to land. Jesus, who is our captain, he announces to his disciples of his plans for his earthly ministry, his spiritual flight, which was now getting ready to come to an end. And Jesus makes strict preparations to prepare his disciples for what he would ultimately have to face, which was a cruel, cold criminal's cross on Calvary. Jesus Christ now, according to verse 29, has now left Bethany, where he more than likely was the guest at the home of Mary Martha and the now resurrected Lazarus. And he moves from Bethany now up to the mountainous city called Jerusalem. And by no coincidence, he's in Jerusalem at the exact moment of the feast of the Passover. Before I go any further, you need to know today that it is no coincidence that Jesus is in Jerusalem at the exact moment of the Passover, not by accident, but by divine providence. One of the qualities that were near and dear to Jesus, that one in which we all admired and which endeared us to him was his innate ability to always show up at the right place right on time. Somebody can say amen to the fact that he is an on-time God. 
He shows up on time out of observance to the Jewish feasts and festivals. Jesus was cognizant of Jewish law. He knew without a shadow of a doubt that the law declared that every male resident that lived within a 20-mile radius of Jerusalem was obligated to attend the feast. And Jesus, being an adherent Jew, adherent to the law, he shows up at Jerusalem at the Passover feast. What an awesome sight to see the Savior at the feast of the Jews. It is significant, particularly when we're studying the feast of the Jews, that we know there were three primary feasts that the Jews were obligated to attend every year. These feasts, amen, are very, very significant. And I believe that there are qualities and there are some things about these feasts that we ought to glean and, and apply in our everyday walk of life. I want to talk very briefly about these feasts. First of all, there was the Feast of the Tabernacles. There were the Feast of the Pentecost. And then there was the Feast of the Passover. I would that you would write that down. There was the Feast of the Tabernacles. It was the Feast of the Pentecost and the Feast of the Passover. The Feast of the Tabernacles was a very significant feast for it was a feast designed to commemorate the wilderness wanderings of the children of Israel. It was a time, Peter, when the people got together and thanked God for how God preserved them as they traveled from Egypt into Canaan. Of course, Egypt denoted the place of not enough. Canaan denoted the place of more than enough. But the wilderness was that place of not enough. And it was there at that place of, of just barely enough, rather, that, that, that God preserved them, that God kept them. And when the Jews would celebrate the Feast of the Tabernacles to commemorate their preservance that they received from God for seven days, they would make tents or booths and they would leave their comfortable homes and live in these tents or booths for seven days to commemorate what God had done and had God, how good God had been to their forefathers in their past. I want to suggest this morning that every now and then we are the pause to give God praise for how God has preserved us over the years. Because the truth be told, it has not been us that has brought us, but somebody better understand it was the Lord that's been good to us. We have not kept ourselves in our right mind. We have not kept ourselves so holy. We have not kept ourselves even so healthy. But can anybody admit that the Lord has preserved you? He's kept you in your right mind. The Lord has kept us when we didn't even want to keep ourselves. And so when the Jews would get together to celebrate the Feast of the Tabernacles, it was a feast based on the perseverance of God, how God had preserved them. But the second feast that they were obligated to attend was the Feast of the Weeks or the Feast of the Pentecost. Of course, the word pente means 50, suggesting that this feast took place 50 days after the Pentecost. This Feast of the Weeks, which took place again seven completed weeks after the Pentecost, seven times seven being 49. This feast took place 50 days or, off the, or after the 49th day of the Passover was a time when the people got together to praise God for the harvest. They would praise God for the provision, how God blessed during the prior year. When they would get together during the Feast of the Pentecost, they would praise God for the harvest. And during this time, they would bring the first fruits of the harvest, the best of their flock. They would get together and bring a tenth into the temple to let God know how grateful they were for his provision. They would get together and not take any blessing for granted. They didn't take the, the harvest for granted, the grain for granted, the corn for granted, the barley for granted. They would get together and praise God for his provision. What an awesome feast the Feast of Pentecost was. For it was their way of letting God know, Lord, I have not taken any of your provisions for granted. Oh God, somebody today. You are the pause every now and then, John, to praise God just for his provisions. 
You ought to praise God, acknowledging the fact that it was by his strength that he gave you the strength to obtain wealth. We ought to praise God for his provision. For some of us have not, didn't know how we were going to make it. We didn't know how we were going to pay our bills. We didn't know how we were going to come up with tuition to send our children to school. Oh, God, y'all ain't hearing me. We didn't know how we were going to make it from day to day. Some even now don't even know how they're living on a fixed income but we ought to praise God just for him being a provider are y'all hearing me and when these Jews got together to celebrate this feast what an awesome time they had uh, worshiping and praising God simply because they wanted God to know Lord I've not taken anything you've given me for granted I understand God it was the rain that allowed the crops to grow it was the sun that allowed the crops to grow so God I thank you for the sunshine and the rain is there anybody in the building today can pause to say, Lord, I thank you just for all of the provisions that you've already given me. So much so, God, that if you never give me anything else, I praise you for what you've already done. If you never give me another raise, I, I can praise you for the rest of my life. Amen. For what you've all, if you never do it again, if you never open another door, if you never heal me again, if you never make a way out of a way, no way again. You've done it so many times in the past. I pause to give you a provider, a provision praise. I, I pause to tell you thank you just for all of your blessing is there somebody today that can pause just to give God praise for provision are you hearing me but the provision, not just for the big stuff, but praise him uh, for the little stuff. He provided you a uh, uh, soundness of mind. He provided you fervent of strength. He provided you uh, the use to put your hands together. You could have been in a coma. You could have been uh, out of your right mind. You could have been in Jackson Memorial Hospital. Better, worse than that, you could have been in Dave Memorial uh, Graveyard. But you ought to praise God for he provided a strength enough to give him praise and so they would get together I'm going somewhere they would get together and they would praise God for these feasts the first feast was the feast of the tabernacle a, a time where they thank God for his uh, perseverance the second feast was the feast of Pentecost where they thank God for his provision but then the greatest of the three feasts was the, was the feast of the Passover which was the time that they celebrated how the death angel leaped over the children of Israel in Egypt and consumed all of the Egyptian firstborn children. Are you hearing me? Some might remember the story how Moses, amen, commanded the children of Israel to place blood on the doorpost. And when the death angel came through the city, the death angel bypassed or passed over the children of Israel and then consumed every firstborn Egyptian. And therefore, the children of Israel with pause to celebrate the Passover annually, thanking God for his protection. Can I talk to somebody today? It's nothing wrong with the Passover celebration annually, but I believe uh, we can do better than that. I believe every day when we wake up in the morning and realize that death has passed over us, when you wake up in the morning and realize that, that thieves and robbers passed over your house, when sickness passed over your house, oh God, y'all ain't hearing me. Every morning uh, when you wake up and realize uh, that something negative and catastrophic could have happened to you but it passed over you you ought to give God a pass over praise I don't understand how some of us who are cognizant of the fact that God has been good to you and pass over you with some things that you knew you deserved but still come to church and sit down like a bump on the log and not give God praise some of us deserve cancer some of us deserve AIDS and some of us that oh God y'all ain't hearing me some of us deserve to be dead. Others of us deserve to be uh, in a mental hospital. But I'm grateful to God that he let what I deserve pass over me. 
Y'all going to make me preach it till I get happy. Cheney, I'm grateful to God that there's some stuff I deserve. The Lord know I deserve. The devil know I deserve. But that's when his grace and his mercy kick in. Help me, God. And so when I come to church, Kenny, and I begin to praise God like I lost my mind, it's not because of the car I trust me. It's not because of the house I live in. It's not because of the creature comforts the creator allowed me to possess. But it's because I recognize it should have been me and it wasn't. I recognize the fact I don't deserve to be here. But his mercy blessed me so much that adversity has passed over me. Ask your neighbor, have you celebrated Passover today? Tell him, neighbor, you still got time. That you still have time. Come on, the day ain't over. If you hadn't celebrated Passover, you, you, you still have time. If you haven't celebrated the fact that last night you were in between life and death and the Lord woke you up. If you hadn't celebrated the fact that when you woke up this morning, you had a car to drive, clothes to wear, food to eat, water to drink, peace of mind. If you woke up this morning and hadn't celebrated Passover yet, baby, you still got time to get on your feet, to put your hands together and come magnify the name of the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. You still have time to celebrate. Thank you. Passover, Passover. Jesus, Jesus. He shows up. Sit down, sit down. He shows up. He shows up in Jerusalem at the feast of Passover. Tap your neighbors and neighbor, the Passover. Now, he shows up, and this is very, very significant because Jesus was cognizant of the fact that during Passover, lambs would be slain. So he shows up, Cheney, not just to show himself as the Lamb of God, which has come to take away the sin of the world, but he now shows up to present himself as King of Glory. Can the church say King of Glory? Now, this is a very, very pivotal point in the text. In fact, I suggest it is the most poignant point uh, in the whole preaching presentation because uh, Jesus, prior to now, has been very deliberate in masquerading his messianic identity. He has been very deliberate in not, amen, coming forth to reveal to the masses uh, who he really was. But now, in this text, Jesus wants everybody to know that he has has come to be king of kings. Are y'all hearing me? And so what he does is uh, he makes a deliberate effort to be presented as a king. I need to pause here to mention this parenthetically, that I'm not sure if everybody in the building uh, has submitted to the kingship of Jesus Christ in your life. If the Lord is not holding a position, the position as king in your life, he sent me by here to tell you this morning that he is not comfortable just being in the court, but he wants to be king of your life. He wants nothing to take a back seat. He wants to take a back seat to nothing in your life. Every issue, every problem, every situation in your life, Jesus wants to be Take priority over that in your life. Are y'all hearing me? And so he shows up in this text. And in Luke's account, Luke suggests to us that in order for Jesus to be presented as king, a few things were needed. Number one, Jesus needed to have faithful participation. Repeat that with me. Say faithful participation. It is so significant that when you look at the, the, the miracles of Jesus Christ, uh, in fact, if you were to put a microscope on the many miracles of the master, uh, you would discover that his miracles are always centered around the participation of others. That whenever Jesus really wanted uh, to work a miracle uh, for someone or in the life of someone, note that miracle was always predicated on uh, somebody's uh, faithful participation. Can the church say faithful participation? You got to get that because I believe that what holds some of us up from getting our miracles and our blessings uh, uh, is our lack of uh, participation. It is a misnomer that all you have to do is name it and claim it. Oh, it's a very popular charismatic colloquialism, but the fact is uh, you have to do more than just name it and claim it. Uh, uh, the fact of the matter is this. If you really want God to bless you uh, and if you need a miracle, 
miracle in your life, there's some things that you are going to have to do for yourself. Oh, y'all ain't hearing me. Some of you would love for me to tell you that all you had to do was come to church and come to the altar and ask and you shall receive it. But the Bible says that faith without works are dead. There's some things that you have to do for yourself. Check the record, Carlton, you discover that in every miracle of Jesus Christ, somebody had to participate. I don't have time to go through every miracle of Jesus Christ, but just look at the book of John and the miracles in John. John chapter 2. When Jesus turns water uh, into wine, before he did it, he needed participation. Somebody had to fill uh, the water pots. In John chapter 5, when he worked a miracle and healed the impotent man at the pool of Bethesda. He had to participate and bend down and rise and take up his bed and walk. In John chapter 6, when Jesus fed the multitude of 5,000, not including the women and the children, before he did it, somebody had to participate and bring to him the fish and the loaves. Are y'all hearing me? In John chapter 6, the bee claws of the chapter, when Jesus steps on a ship and calms the raging sea, the disciples had to participate and willingly invite him in the ship. Y'all ain't with me yet, huh? In John chapter 9, when Jesus healed the man that was born blind, he had to participate and walk, wash in the pool of Salam. In John chapter 11, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, somebody had to participate and show him where they laid him. Can I talk to somebody? Some of y'all want God to do a miracle for you, but you're not willing to participate but I wish there were some willing participants in the building today that need a miracle so bad from the Lord that you are willing to do whatever the Lord told you to do. In fact, that's why some of y'all worship the way you worship. That's why some of your friends are kind of confused because they can't figure out what you're doing. You ought to tell them, I'm trying to get my miracle. And in order to get my miracle, there's some things I have to do for myself. Maybe Maybe your situation affords you the luxury of non-participation. But my situation is so jacked up, I got to do everything the Lord tells me to do. Am I talking to anybody? Is there anybody in the jacked up class like me? Is there anybody that need a miracle so bad from the Lord that you can't afford the luxury of just sitting down, naming it and claiming it? But do I have anybody that's sowing some seeds? Do I have anybody that's trying to plow in a harvest? Do I have anybody that's praying and fasting and fasting and praying, praying and fasting and fasting and praying, asking God to give you a miracle? Have I got any help in this house? So Luke, stay with me. Luke suggests that the first thing that Jesus needs, stay with me, is faithful participation. Can the church say faithful participation? Let me show it to you in verse number 30. Jesus says, listen, before I go in the city, I'm calling two of my disciples. Stay with me. I want y'all to go into the city. And when you get into the city, you're going to find a coat. It's going to be tied to a post. I want you to go, bring the coat, and if anybody asks you what you're doing with the coat, tell them the master has, are y'all with me? Jesus says, what well, I need you to do, I need you to participate. Can the church say participate? I need you to leave where you are, to go into the city, bring back the coat, and if anybody asks you what you're doing with the coat, tell them that the master has need of note the participation of these disciples. Jesus says, I need you to do three things. Now, note the three things that Jesus tells these disciples to do are the same three things that you and I have to do to participate. He says, number one, I need you to listen. Can the church say listen? Then he says, I need you to loose. Can the church say loose? But then I need you to lift. Can the church say lift? He says, I need you, number one, to listen to me because I need you to go where I tell you to go, then do what I tell you to do, then say what I tell you to say. If you can't listen to instructions to go where I tell you to go and to do what I tell you to do, 
and to say what I tell you to say. You're going to mess up my divine plan. Can I talk to somebody? Somebody in the building, you've been missing your miracle because you have not listened to what the Lord had to say. You see, prayer is not a uh, di monologue, but prayer is a dialogue. Uh, that means when we talk to God, uh, after we finish talking to him, uh, we've got to shut up and let God uh, talk back to us. Help me, God. Uh, some of us, we are guilty because we talk so much, we never shut up. Uh, but sometimes you got to be still and know that God is God. Uh, sometimes you got to hush and let the Lord talk back to you. Help me, God. Has anybody ever talked to God to the point that you stop talking and let God start talking to you? Help me, God. Has anybody ever been in a holding pattern and your friends are trying to figure out what you're waiting on when I'm waiting on my instructions from my control tower? I can't take off till I get my instructions. Help me, God. It reminds me of the other day. I was on a plane, Luden, sitting on the runway. The luggage was already on the plane. I was already in my seat, already had my seatbelt fastened. Uh, however, I couldn't figure out why the plane hadn't taken off yet. Uh, then all of a sudden, the pilot came over the airway and said, we're number five for departure. We've got to sit here till we get clearance from the control tower. Even though I was frustrated, I had to sit there. I was ready to go, but I had to sit. Can I talk to somebody? I'm talking to somebody right now that's frustrated. You're tired. You're busted and disgusted. Uh, you're ready to go to the next level. You're ready to take off into your future. But the law says you got to sit down and wait till I give you clearance. Uh, help me, God. Uh, you got to listen. Tap three people as a neighbor. You got to listen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Tell me, you got to listen. You got to listen. You got to listen. You got to listen, Pastor. But you got to listen for the Lord. Uh, can I preach it like I feel it? Uh, Ruth, you can't listen to everybody. You can't listen to everybody. You got to listen to the Lord. Help me, God. Uh, the pilot on the plane only listens to one voice uh, that come from the air traffic control tower. Note, uh, he don't listen to people on the same level as him. Uh, he don't listen to the co-pilot that's sitting in the cockpit. Uh, the one that he listens to uh, is on a level that's high. Than, oh, Kimmy, can I talk to you? You can't listen to your girlfriend if she's on the same level. You got to listen to so Y'all gonna make me preach like I'm losing my mind. He says, number one, you got to listen. Tell me, you got to listen. But listen, not only must you listen, then you have to loose. Tell me, you got to loose. Check this out. When you get to the coat, the coat is going to be tied up. I, I'm going to tear up something. The coat is going to be tied up. The coat is going to be tied up. Kimber, don't look at me. The coat is going to be tied up. It's going to be tied up. The coat is going to be tied up. It's going to be tied up. Don't worry if I break it, Vince in the bag. Come on. It's going to be tied up. The coat is going to be tied up. Jesus says, I need the coat. But when you get to the coat, the coat is going to be tied up. I'm sending you someplace to get what I need. But when, I, when you get there to get what I need, what I need is going to be bound. So, so, so what, what you got to do is you can't trip because it's bound. The reason it's bound is why I'm sending you. Because I'm giving you loosing power. Help me, God. Can I talk to somebody in this house? Somebody better understand that God has given you loosing power. That you don't have to settle for things being bound in your life. Can I talk to some parent in the building? You don't have to settle for the devil trying to bind your children. You don't have to settle for them trying to take mind control over your children. Did you not know that you have the power to loose your child? You don't have to settle for a bound marriage. But did you not know? Know that you have the power to oh I wish I had some losers in the building I wish I had some people in the house that's not going to settle for being relegated to living in bound conditions touch three people tell them you got to lose some stuff 
You got to loose. You, you, you got to loose. You got to loose. You got to loose. I'm sending you to some bound things. and You, you got to be able to loose, but you can't be scared to, to loose it. You can't be scared to loose it. You can't be scared to take authority over it. Check this out. And the Bible says if somebody asks you why you're loosing it, tell them the Lord has sent me. Help me, God. Aren't y'all glad that when the Lord sends you to loose some stuff, he's not sending you by himself? But, baby, you got backup. Tell somebody I got backup. The backup is the name of the Lord. Oh, God. Look at the Bible. The Bible says if anybody asks you why you are loosing the coat, tell them the Lord has need. Tell the devil, the Lord needs my marriage. He needs my husband. He needs my wife. He needs my children. The Lord needs me. I wish I had some power to preach it. Sit down, sit down. Participation. He says, number one, you got to listen. Two, you got to loose. But then number three, you got to lift. Every neighbor, you got to lift. I'm going to show it to you, Chaney. You got to lift. Note what, note what happened in verse 35. They, they go into the city and, and, and they find this coat and, and they unloose the coat. And they bring the coat back to Jesus. And then note what happens in verse 35. The Bible did not say that Jesus climbed on the coat. But the Bible says that they sat him on the coat. Now, if they sat him on the coat, th that means, oh, y'all ain't feeling me. That, 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 that means they had to do what? Jesus is looking for some folk that's not scared to lift. He's looking for some people that's not scared to lift him. Anybody can lift them on Sunday morning between 11 and 1.30. Anybody can lift them when you're surrounded by Christians. But he's looking for somebody to lift them in the hair salon, in the nail salon. I'm looking for somebody to lift me up on my job. I'm looking for some people that's not scared to lift me up. Have I got any help in this house? And what I want to know is this. Is there anybody under the sound of my voice that's not scared to lift up the name of the Lord? Because you realize if you lift him up, Jesus says, I'll draw all men unto me. Yes, I'm saved to the bone, sanctified to the marrow. I'm not scared to tell nobody who I serve. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God. I'm trying to quit. I got to get out of here. Oh, God. In order for Jesus to be presented as king, First of all, he needed faithful participation. But then Luke suggests that Jesus needs something else. He needs not only faithful participation, but, but, but Luke suggests that he first had to fulfill prophecy. Can the church say fulfill prophecy? Note what the Bible says. The Bible says in verse 35 that when they sit Jesus on the, on, on the coat, th th then the inference of the text is this. He rides into town on the donkey. Matthew, Mark, and John says, as he's riding through town on the donkey, they're yelling, Hosea in the highest. Are y'all still with me? Now, in every one of the recordings, the inference is Jesus is on the donkey riding through town. The savior of the world, the captain of of our soul. Are y'all hearing me? The one who is the visual image of the invisible God. Jesus is riding on a donkey. Could he not find anything better to ride on than a mule? Are y'all still here? The Christ is on a colt. 
Jesus is on a jackass riding through town. It, it, it kind of bothered me because I thought for sure that, that I mean, for, for Jesus, that, I mean, surely they would have found a horse. I, I mean, a stallion, maybe like a white, like a white horse, like Zorro, like a horse, you know, it's like, like, you know, Long Ranger, one of those kind of horses, one of them stallions, like one of them Clydesdales, no, one of them Budweiser. One of them Budweiser horses. Oh, y'all ain't hearing me. You, 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 you've seen the horse. You've seen the Budweiser. I, I, but, 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 but the question, the, the question it is, is, Corinne, why would Jesus ride through town on a jackass, on, on a donkey, on a colt? Why, why would G on a mule, a half-breed horse, that's what a mule is. Well, the answer is fulfillment of prophecy. Oh, God, we got a little time. Look in the index and find Zechariah very quickly. Come on, find Zechariah. Look in the index first and find Zechariah. If not, we'll be here until sunrise. <laughs> look in the index. Come on, find Zechariah really quick. Look on the page number. Everybody look in the index. You won't look so bad. Everybody look in the index and find Zechariah. Chapter number nine. Verse Number nine. Are y'all there? Come on, let's look and see what Zechariah 9, verse 9, has to say. If you have it, let's read it together. Are y'all with me? Okay, let's read. Zechariah 9, 9. It says what? Oh, Zion, shout. O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He's what? And having what? He's what? Riding what? And a what? And the foal. Note, note what Zechariah says. Zechariah says, behold, the king is coming. And when he comes, he's not going to be on a stallion. He's not going to be on the Clydesdale. But when he comes, he's going to come riding on an ass, a colt, the foal of an ass. He's riding on a colt, a mule. Are y'all hearing me? Now, when you stop and think about it, I'm grateful that the Lord came riding on a mule. Because when you look at the symbolism associated with the mule, each one point to the Savior. First of all, the Bible says in verse 30, look in verse 30. When you look in verse 30 of the text, the Bible says that this mule had never had the privilege of a person sitting on top of the mule. Are y'all hearing me? So first of all, this mule spoke of something that was sacred. Can the church say sacred? It was sacred in the sense that this mule was set apart, that, that nobody had ever rode on this mule before. Are y'all with me? And so the mere fact that this mule had been set aside, uh, uh, it, it really speaks of the character of Jesus Christ because when something has been set aside, what happened is it is holy, it is preserved, which speaks of the character of Jesus Christ. Are y'all hearing me? Now, one writer suggests that because the mule had never been ridden before that the mule in all likelihood was a wild mule meaning that the mule had never been broken in before and anyone that ever had ridden a wild horse or a wild mule uh, had the propensity to be thrown off or bucked off the mule. However the mere fact that this mule had never been broken meaning never been ridden before but it was brought to Jesus and Jesus sat on top of the mule and the mule submitted to the sovereignty of the Savior really suggests that even the beast of the field has to submit to the authority of Jesus Christ. Come here, can I talk to somebody? If a jackass can submit to Jesus, why can't we? Oh, God. 
Oh God, if a mule can submit to the sovereignty of Jesus Christ, why can't we submit? Here it is, here it is, here it is, Ruth. This mule didn't try to buck authority, didn't try to buck Jesus off, but the mule submitted to the sovereignty of, oh, I want to talk to somebody in this house because somebody needs to get to the point that you are so submitted to the Savior that whatever the Lord tells you to do, even if you don't understand it, you're going to do it because in the back of your mind, you know that all things work together for good uh, of them that love the Lord to those who are the called according to his purpose uh, this mule was sacred but not only was the mule a symbol of sacredness it was a symbol of serenity when the warriors rode to town they rode on stallions but when a king came in peace he rode on a mule meaning this when Jesus showed up he was showing up to let them know peace I leave with you my peace I give to you now there's the world give peace, I give unto thee. Are y'all hearing me? The mule was a symbol of strength. The donkey bore the burden of the traveler. Jesus bore our burdens. He was riding on the mule, speaks to us to tell us, come unto him, all those that labor and heavy laden. Like the donkey, he will tip us strength. He will take our yoke upon himself. Give us his yoke. His yoke is easy. His burdens are light. Are y'all hearing me? And so when Jesus submitted to riding on a coat, it was for the fulfillment of prophecy. Can the church say fulfillment of prophecy? Which really speaks of everything that Jesus ever done. When you look at his life, I got to hurry. But when you look at his whole life, everything about Jesus was about submitting to the fulfillment of prophecy. He was born of a virgin. That was the fulfillment of prophecy. Raised up in the ghetto of Nazareth. That was the fulfillment of prophecy. Having miracle working power. That was the fulfillment of prophecy. Living a sinless life. That was the fulfillment of prophecy. Being rejected and despised of men. That was the fulfillment of prophecy. Him him being a man of sorrows acquainted with grief that was a fulfillment of prophecy him being wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities uh, that was a fulfillment of prophecy him dying uh, on Calvary's cross that was nothing but a fulfillment of prophecy but him getting up on the third day morning according to the scriptures uh, that was a fulfillment of prophecy but he got one more to fulfill uh, that he's going to come back again uh, and every eye shall see every knee shall bow and when he comes back he He's going to do it just to fulfill the prophecy. Don't think he ain't coming back. In fact, I heard him say, when you hear wars and rumors of wars, when you see mama against the daughter, our daddies against son, earthquake and diverse places, I'm getting ready to come back. And he is going to come back for the fulfillment of prophecy. Are y'all hearing me today? Here it is. Here it is. Luke says, in order for Jesus to be presented at king, Number one, he needed to have faithful participants. He needed the fulfillment of prophecy. But the final thing that Luke suggests that Jesus needs, and this text teaches us, is that he needed the fullness of praise. Look at verse 37, and I'm finished. The Bible says, and when he was come down, nigh, even from the mountain of olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice. Can the church say whole multitude? This is a misleading phrase. This phrase, it suggests that everybody that was following Jesus was a disciple. This phrase in verse 37, y'all got to get this. Tell your neighbor, don't miss this. It suggests in verse 37 that everybody following Jesus was a disciple. Because the verse says, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice. But the phrase whole multitude suggests that it was not just disciples in the crowd. Look at verse 39. Because the Bible says in verse 39 that the Pharisees from among the what? Began to criticize. So here it is. In the multitude, there was a mixture of people. Can the church say mixed multitude? I want to suggest that there were three crowds following Jesus. Can the church say three crowds? I further want to suggest that each one of these crowds following Jesus are crowds that's in church every Sunday morning. And I want to know what crowd 
are you in? Are y'all hearing me? Before I leave, I want to know what crowd you're in because you're in one of these three crowds. The first crowd that was following Jesus was the crowd that was loyal to the custom. Can the church say loyal to the custom? There were people there that were there because of the Passover feast. They were not there because of Jesus, but they were there because it was Passover. They were not there because of the Lord, but there because the law told them to be there. So whether Jesus showed up or not, they were going to the Passover because that's what they grew up doing. They grew up going to the feast every year. They grew up going to celebrate. They grew up going to the annual feast because they were loyal to the custom. There's Pope in the building today, Cecil, that are loyal to the custom. You are here because that's what you do on Sunday morning. You go to church because you grew up going to church. You, grew, you go to church because that's what you're supposed to do. Amen. Between 11 and 1. And that's why when it gets lived after 1, you start looking at your watch because it takes you out your custom. It's customary. Help me, Jesus. I'm going to pre preach, Pastor Jackson. I'm trying. It, it's custom. You're here. You ain't here to praise God. You ain't here to give God a tithe. You ain't here, amen, to bless God. You ain't here to help the service. Uh, you're here because it is Sunday morning, and that's what you do. You get your church going God, Sunday morning, go to church clothes on. Get your fat hat on and your nice clothes on. Get your nice shoes on. You go to be seen sitting in the sanctuary as if the Savior is happy that you're here. But you ain't giving God praise. You're here because you are loyal to the custom. Custom, tell your neighbor, I hope that you're not in that crowd. But then there's another crowd that's behind Jesus Christ. Gwen, the first crowd was the crowd that was loyal to the custom. But then the second crowd was the crowd that was looking to criticize. Oh, yeah, the Pharisees were in the crowd, and the Pharisees were fault finders. Everything that the Lord did, they found fault. Are y'all hearing me? Everything that he did, they were there looking to find fault. There are people today that you're here only to find fault. You ain't here to follow the Father, but you're here to find fault. Help me, God. You criticize. Nothing satisfies you. If we after 1 o'clock, church were too long, and microphones were too loud, people jumped on my foot. Help me, God. Choir was all preacher was it's too long. Oh, y'all ain't hearing me. You ain't satisfied with nothing, but you're here only to find fault. Are y'all hearing me? And there are people in your life that are there just to criticize. You can't please them. I don't care what you try to do. If you lose weight, they call you skinny. Gain weight, they call you fat. Speak to everybody, they call you a flirt. Don't speak to nobody, they call you stuck up. Help me, God. You can't please them. They are fault-finding folk. I call them the 3M crowd. There's fault-finders. Help me, God. Nothing you do satisfies them. If you're too hard, they call you a taskmaster. If you're not hard enough, they call you lazy. You can't please, folk. They are fault finders. Tell your neighbor, I hope you're not in that crowd. But you're running out. You're running out. You're running out of the crowds. You're about to find one. You're running out of the crowds. But the last crowd, listen, were those that are not loyal to the custom, those that were not looking to criticize. It was those that were there because they loved the Christ. It was those that were there because they simply loved Jesus. They didn't care what the custom was. They didn't care who was criticizing. They were there simply because they showed enough love to them some Jesus. I want to talk to some people right now that fit into that last crowd. You don't care about the custom. In fact, you didn't come to hear Pastor Jackson, you came to hear Jesus through whoever was preaching. I want to talk to somebody who just showed enough love the Lord. You love him not because of what he does, but you love him because of who he is. You love him because of, oh God, how he reveals himself to you. Is there anybody in the crowd that's here because you love the Christ? Sit down. Trying to finish, but look at verse 37. Keep your Bibles open. Look at verse 37. The Bible says, cook, that as Jesus came down from the crowd, from the mountain, the whole multitude began to rejoice and praise God. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Pastor, didn't you just say there were critics in the crowd? Didn't you just say, Pastor, 
there were custom goers in the crowd. But the text says everybody in the crowd praised the Lord. Oh, you can't tell who, who's who by their praise. You can't tell who's saved by how loud they holler. You can't tell who's saved by how much they run around the building. Oh, y'all going to get mad at me. You can't tell who's anointed by how they run around the church. Uh, some people are running because the devil's chasing them. Help me, God. Uh, you can't tell who can't tell who's what because they praise God with a loud voice. Uh, that sometimes the most spiritual people are the ones that sit down and just nod their head. Uh, sometimes the most Holy Ghost filled people are the ones that just simply wave their hand. Help me, God. Uh, you don't have to run. Listen, listen, listen. Uh, you're running around the church. Uh, it's not a barrage of your spirituality. It's a sign of your athleticism. Help me, God. If you can run around the church, it don't mean you holy. It means you're in good shape. Talk to me, somebody. Listen, listen, listen. They were loud. Trying to quit. Can I have five more minutes? Something bothered me about, I got visitors here. I got visitors. I got, they want to go to the Milton's party. Let me let them out. Verse 37, it, it bothered me because they, they, everybody was praising the Lord. And they were loud with it. Oh, God. But, but their praise was not real. Loud does not mean legitimate. You can have intensity without integrity. Can I give you a scripture? Romans 10, you have a zeal of God. Hey, you but not according to knowledge. Are y'all hearing me? And so they were zealous, but not spiritual. How do you know, Pastor? Look in the text. I'm going to show it to you. Come on, look at the text. The Bible says they praise God with a loud voice. Here it comes. For all the mighty works that they had seen. Their praise was based, Eddie, on what they saw. Oh, yeah, that went over somebody's head. Let me just break it down. I ain't got time for you to figure it out. Your praise cannot be out of observation. Can I trust you? Observation. Because if you just praise God based on what you see, what happened at nighttime? Oh, God, y'all ain't hearing me. What, what, what happened during the night season? What, what happens when the Lord takes you through a tunnel of tragedy, a tunnel of despair? What happens when the Lord allows it to get dark in your life? Oh, y'all ain't hearing me. Somebody better bear witness to the fact that it can get dark in your life. Somebody better give, recognize that it can get nighttime in your life. When you don't know where your child is all night long, that's nighttime. Help me, God. When you just got laid off, it is nighttime. When your child is in trouble, that's nighttime. Listen, you can't have a praise that based solely on observation. Your praise got to be born out of adoration. You can't praise God based on what you perceive. You got to praise God based on what you experience. You got to know that you know that you know that whenever you're in a nighttime situation that God is still deserving of your praise. Can I talk to somebody in this house? It's one thing to praise him with a loud voice, but you can't praise him based on what you see. You got to praise him based on what you no, you've got to know that your redeemer liveth. You've got to know that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can ever ask, say, or think. Am I talking to anybody today that know that God won't let you down? He won't let you fall. You got to praise him based on what you know. Let me get out of here. Let me get out of here. And so. Here it is. They were praising God based on observation and not adoration. And because of that, their praise was not real. 
But I thank God today that if the Lord is going to be presented as king in your life, he needs the fullness of your praise. Tell your neighbor the fullness of your praise. Well, Pastor Jackson, how do I give him the fullness of your praise? How do I know that my praise is fullness? How do I know that my praise is pleasing to the Lord? Well, let me give you three quick signs. Then we'll let you go. Number one, your praise is pleasing to the Lord when your praise becomes liberating. Can the church say liberating? It becomes liberating. Note that when the Bible says that as Jesus passed down the street, Mark, Luke didn't say it, but Mark, John, and Matthew said it. He said that the crowd was yelling, Hosanna in the highest. That word, Hosanna, in the Greek, uh, it means save now. They were praising a liberating praise. Your praise becomes real when your praise becomes liberating. When you can praise God in the midst of a constricting situation and literally praise your way out. Help me, God. Uh, praise becomes uh, real uh, when you can praise your way out of depression. Uh, Paul says, I think myself happy. Help me, God, uh, that I'm not allowing uh, my situation to dictate my level of praise, uh, that I turn up the volume of my praise, uh, even in the midst of adverse situations. Uh, tap someone and say, neighbor, turn up the volume. Turn up the volume of your praise. It ought to be loud and liberating. It ought to liberate you from bound people and bound situations, uh, bound circumstances. Whenever you find yourself uh, in certain situations, your praise ought to be your passport uh, out of that particular predicament. Your praise uh, ought to be the catalyst that catapults you out of that calamity you find yourself confronted with. Are y'all hearing me? Uh, uh, your praise ought to be liberating. Uh, However, your praise ought not just be loud and liberating, but your praise ought to be lasting. Note, if you will, in verse 39, that the Pharisees tried to get these disciples to shut up. But note what Jesus says. Jesus says, listen, they got the can't help it. In fact, I can't help but be praised because if they hold their peace, I have some inanimate objects. I got some rocks that are willing to cry out and praise me. Here is the point. The point is your praise must be lasting. Your praise must be continuous because of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. He must be praised. Tap someone and say, neighbor, he's going to be praised. Oh yeah, he's going to be praised. Listen, listen, listen. If you get beside yourself and not want to wave it out, uh, he got palm trees uh, that are able to wave out praise. If you get beside yourself and don't want to open your mouth, uh, God got birds that can chirp it out, frogs that can crow it out, dogs uh, that can bark it out, cats that can meow it out, uh, cows that can moo it out. Help me, God. Uh, snakes that can siss it out. Uh, uh, but the point is this, uh, that the Lord is going to be praised. Uh, and when you praise God, your praise ought to be lasting. It ought to be the kind of praise that you don't cut off in times of uh, times of, of difficulty. It ought to be the kind of praise that David had in Psalms 34 when David declared, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Oh God, are y'all hearing me? And so now, sisters and brothers, I held you too long already. So now Luke says, that the aim of the Almighty uh, is to be presented as the King of Glory. Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, there were people in the Bible uh, and maybe somebody under the sound of my voice uh, that don't know who the King of Glory really is. Uh, and in search of trying to help you uh, identify who the King of Glory is, uh, I talked to David the other day, uh, and David says, Pastor Jackson, uh, I want to help you identify who the king of glory really is. David said in Psalms 24 listen he said lift up your heads O ye gates and be lifted up ye everlasting doors and the king of glory shall come in. But then he asked the question who is the king of glory and he came back and said it is the Lord strong and mighty 
mighty. Uh, it is the Lord. I'm mighty in battle. Uh, lift up your heads, uh, holy gates, uh, and be lifted up. Uh, ye everlasting doors, uh, and the King of glory uh, shall come in. Who is the King of glory? Uh, the Lord of hosts. Uh, he is uh, the King of glory. Uh, and I don't know uh, who I'm talking to, uh, but I stopped by this afternoon uh, just to give y'all a word from the Lord uh, that he desires to be your king. Uh, and if he is your king, you ought to enter into his courts with thanksgiving. Uh, if he is your king, you ought to enter into his presence uh, with praise in your mouth. Uh, I'm you, I'm not talking to you, but do me a favor. Turn to your neighbor and look him in the face and say, neighbor, I know who the king of glory is. I know who the king of glory is. Hey, he's Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. B, he's the bridge over troubled waters. See, he calms all my fears. He controls my anxieties. D, he delivers me from evil. E, he's everlasting. The everlasting. F, he's a friend to the friendless. G, he's good on Monday. He's good on Tuesday. G, he's God all by himself. He's great. He's glorious. Have I got a witness here? H, he's holy all by himself. He's my hope for tomorrow. Joy in sorrow. I, oh God. I, he's God in himself. Are y'all hearing me? I, he's God by himself. If I couldn't say a word, I'd wave my hand in the right. He inspects when I'm wrong. Are y'all hearing me? You don't know him. I'm trying to tell y'all he's the king of kings. And if you know who I'm talking about, do me a favor. Turn to your neighbor for the last time. Reach way down in your preaching voice and say, neighbor, I know who the king is. Jesus that's my king, Jesus, that's my king, he died just for me, but early, 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 Sunday morning, he got up from the grave with power, power, He wants to be king. He wants to be king. Not just savior, but Jesus. Want to be king. 